uh, Wyatt Boutwell with HBW Resources. HBW Resources, did I hear that, that correct? That is correct. Well, tell me a little bit about that uh, company, what you guys are doing with the oil and gas uh, industry. We do a lot of work in the energy space trying to manage political risk for midstream companies upstream. We do some work, too, in the renewable space because siting issues, uh, the politics of that at a local level can be just probably more tricky than uh, pipelines and conventional production. But it's um, we help run public education campaigns that strengthen companies' ability to operate different regions. Let me ask you about some of the political vibes out there, if you will. Uh, you mentioned, yep. obviously, the renewable side of things. Uh, it's no secret the narrative, the conversation, the direction is, is renewable. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, there's some question on the science. There's some question on the speed. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what you guys are doing in the, in the, word, in the realms of renewable and local and, and fossil fuels. Okay. Uh, you know... What's not talked about much is just how absolutely essential natural gas is, even if you don't use it for backup fuel for renewables because energy storage just isn't there yet. And that's a reality. And I think it's something that policymakers don't want to talk about because it's unpopular. Uh, but, you know, what's been interesting to me is how little has been said in the media about global economic growth, particularly in Asia, where Brookings Institute out of D.C., as a report that came out probably 2018 that was saying that by the end of 2020, over half the world would be middle class. And it's because economic development is accelerating. There's greater need for, for energy. And we got a golden opportunity with natural gas that's often overlooked for being able to reduce emissions that people are concerned about, and rightfully so, um, without having to fundamentally change consumer behavior. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to convince consumers. They don't have to change their behavior, but we can have significant reductions in emissions, and that's just not making it into the press. Um, it's very unpopular to talk about it, but uh, I think there's some opportunities there if we're pragmatic, if both sides are pragmatic. If, even if you're supportive of uh, transition completely to renewables, if you're a pragmatist, you have to see natural gas as a key component in that. Let me ask you how uh, your opinion, I guess, on why fossil fuels has become so political. I'll even go a step further and say it's even gotten a little bit beyond political, and it's kind of in that realm of when cigarettes were, you know, people yeah. wanted cigarettes at the bottom of the ocean or at the moon. Yeah. You know, so it seems like it's it's almost fall, fallen into that where it's like beyond political and it's gotten into, you know, kind of a discriminatory industry type of a thing. Well, I mean... I this is, this is just my opinion, and not, you know, I should give a disclaimer that uh, these are my opinions and not those of HVW resources or blah, blah, blah. But uh, I think that there is a level of uh, political pragmatism. Uh, we're seeing such uh, polarization on energy issues that pipelines used to be a, a non-issue. It wasn't until, really until Keystone that anyone cared. Um, I think that at a very basic level, They've looked at uh, opponents of, uh, how should I put it, the Democrats, I hate to make this a, a partisan issue, but Democrats looked at the funding sources of the Republican resurgence in the United States in the mid-1990s. If you go and look, uh, arguably, the oil and gas industry has been the single most important funder of the Republican Party. Um, and its resurgence and growth and significance and dominance in uh, the Deep South and in energy-producing basins. So uh, I think that there's been a lot of uh, political wrangling over this issue because there's an opportunity to hobble a, f a funding source for the oppo opposing party. And it used to be Democrats and Republicans both acknowledged that we needed a robust energy mix. And now it is simply partisan politics. It's very, very, very hard to find a Democrat at the national level who will support fossil fuels. Uh, Henry Cuellar, whose district is down on the coast, um, Gulf Coast of Texas, um, for instance, 
he votes with Republicans on energy issues because his his uh, district encompasses the Eagleford Shale. He's going to be primary. He has someone running against him on the left within his own party because, in part, because of his energy stance about fossil fuels. So, I probably taken that far beyond what you intended with your question, but uh, I hope that's helpful. No, it is, it, and the thing is, it's a very complex issue. I mean. A lot of times I would just preface it by saying, you know, when I grew up, like in the 90s is when I graduated high school, mm-hmm. er, the early 90s. And, you know, the, the energy wasn't political. I mean, nobody ever, I mean, gas prices people would complain about, but never was it political like it is today. And when I look back, there was low oil prices for a decade. And so I don't know if one thing had anything to do with the other. But one thing I do know is that when there was a decade of low oil prices, you also had a decade of not hiring. So you had a generation or two generations, some might even say three generations of kids and and uh, adults that were not exposed to the intertwining of the energy industry. And a lot like what happened with agriculture, where people really lost touch with how a burger was made. You know, you'll get a protester that will say, we need to end, you know, factory farms, and then they'll all go out for burgers afterwards. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of like that, where they've, they've gotten so out of touch, they don't realize, you know, where the meat comes from in the grocery store. I don't think people realize how a light switch turns on or how a Tesla car battery is powered by natural gas and, you know, are charged up by natural gas. So I I, I see where kind of there's a real complex issue here, but um, it it's gotten to a point to where I, I think the energy industry has some concerns, you know. And so when I look at what's happened in Colorado with some of the state's rights issues. And then I look at what's happening in Mexico and Asia with, boy, those markets are really opening up. People are really having to rethink how they do. We're having to reimagine energy. Does that make sense there, Mr. Wyatt Boutwell? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, I think for, I think your points about being disconnected from primary, uh, you know, production, like for instance, knowing how to, you know, uh, butcher a, a hog or, you know, butcher a chicken and uh, being disconnected. A lot of that's because we have such advanced economies. And a lot of those economies were, were powered by fossil fuels and that transition. And so there's a lot to be thankful for for our standards of living. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that there's so much global opportunity uh, to lower emissions by allowing us to do what we do best. We're the most environmentally sensitive producer of oil and gas in the world. And we've got an abundance of it because of, you know, up in the Bakken, the issues with flaring, both in the Permian and the Bakken. If we had adequate takeaway capacity, that's not all of it, but that's a greater portion of it. We can get this to market lower emissions while still making money for mineral owners throughout the United States and also producing companies and service companies. So. I think that's really blind. People aren't as self-aware about that. And what's really surprising to me is you find generally progressives are really active on the international front. They're really interested in our involvement in the UN and really uh, prick to their conscience about our lack of involvement in the Paris Accord. But they can't see international markets as being the tool for encouraging good policies that lower emissions globally. Uh, that's really what's striking. And uh, I'll say one other thing. Uh, you should, uh, I would really recommend people Google uh, Patagonia and its stance. <clears throat> I imagine you're familiar with the sportswear brand being from North Dakota. Um, Patagonia will not allow um, companies that either finance or directly support uh, fossil fuels from using their uh, co-branding on their Patagonia fleece. Uh, They say that they're in the business of being ecologically sensitive. Patagonia makes all their products from oil. Not all of it, but their their fleece is made from from oil. And it's this dissonance, this inability to see where products come from. And a willing to, I mean, almost like in the law of willful blindness, not wanting to acknowledge the dependence that's really creating uh, some political headwinds for the industry going forward. 
uh, because you can't, it's almost like you can't even talk about facts anymore. Uh, the facts, uh, the benefits, the, the tax revenue, the uh, jobs, things like that aren't moving people like it used to. And a lot of it's because we have unprecedented prosperity in this country that's been brought about to a great degree by having some of the cheapest energy uh, prices on earth. So it's a very complicated issue. I think it extends well beyond what we could possibly touch on in an interview. But it's an issue for not only for domestic producers, but if you're in the international marketplace and you want to develop, say, in India or China, uh, access to energy that we have an abundance of is it, going to be critical for meeting the, the climate goals that are being set right now internationally. Give a mention to the uh, Crude Life interview with Dayton Mars uh, with the, his Patagonia story. We had him on a, about yeah. a month ago on the program explaining how he put in an order for some co-branded backpacks, and uh-huh. uh, they flat out rejected his order and, yep. and cited that because he works and does business with the oil and gas industry, they cited it right by name. <clears throat> and... Um, that's that's you know that's unfortunate that's where we're at because there is that disconnect and I do think there uh, uh, the robust economy really does have a lot to do with that like you said that's a great point on that uh, flaring talk to me a little bit about flaring where you guys are coming from when it when, when that, that's another really hot issue from a lot of different angles yeah. how, how do you guys look at and tackle flaring when it comes to the Political well, side. I think I think we all acknowledge. You talk to anybody; it, it's suboptimal. You don't want to be doing it. Uh, the issue is, you generally have political opposition to creating the infrastructure to get the flare gas to market. Now, that's less of an ordeal, probably in North Dakota. It's certainly an issue, believe it or not, uh, in, in West Texas. And so, I think that we support the build out of infrastructure so that you know. Consumers can get products. Um, we generally look at markets to, to solve a majority of the problems. Uh, and so I think that there's some financial incentives for these things to be uh, put through so that you've got adequate takeaway capacity for these basins so they can get that product to market. Uh, that's generally where we look at things. Not that markets are perfect, but they're certainly better than the planning apparatus of the state. Uh, so, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of conversation going on, and it could be some tension, too, between midstream companies and producers. Uh, in Texas, like the Railroad Commission, had a case recently in which Williams Pipeline brought a case before the Railroad Commission for Exco out of Dallas uh, because Exco was flaring gas even though they had access to Williams Pipeline. And so the question is... Um, there's all kinds of legal questions there. And I think uh, Williams brought suit um, in Texas courts over the issue. But there's got to be some uh, broader discussions about what flaring does for the public reputation of producers, what it does for the industry. And that be part of the consideration on the economics of, of pipelines and whether producers should be required to get that product into a pipeline if they can. So. That's a very long answer to your question. Uh, you want any more clarification on any points? Well, it, it's it, it's another one of those complex ones to where, you know, pipelines are such a big part of it and um, the opposition. But then there's even the, the side of you know, mineral ownership. Um, you know, I mean, this is, this is a topic no one likes talking about, which is in a lot of cases, a lot of that uh, gas that's being flared, no one's getting paid on, including the mineral owners and yeah. it would be nice to have some local dollars stimulate those economies. You know what I mean? Well, I think that's it. I, I think that the, the challenge has been, and I want to go ahead and say, I have a very cursory knowledge on the mechanics. I was an, I'm an upstream guy more than midstream, but I think that there's quite the argument to be made that you need to be concerned mineral owners I think it's good for everybody. Uh, but, you know, I think there's some bigger issues than the ones that are more granular to individual mineral owners in, in the basins. I think there needs to be broader support for LNG export initiatives. I'll mention one that we're working on right now, the 
has a lot of opportunities for the Rockies. It's called Western States and Tribal Nations. Um, we just uh, it's a memorandum of understanding between Western states to help support the LNG permitting processes for facilities like Jordan Cove, which is in Oregon, and also supporting Total and Semper has an LNG export facility just south of San Diego on the Pacific. That trying to get new opportunities for Western gas, and you know, this is an opportunity for North Dakota producers too um, to get to more competitive markets through the West Coast. Those are sorts of things I think are going to give long-term value to mineral owners in addition to the more direct uh, pipeline issues that are there. As you, once you create new markets, that's going to incentivize the build-out of adequate infrastructure to get this stuff out and benefit mineral owners. But it's going to take a comprehensive approach to it. And uh, I think LNG going to, to Asia is one of, the, one of the levers that can be pulled to help improve mineral owners' uh, uh, the values of their of their rights. How about key points for 2020 as we take a look at, you know, we're kind of ending the year here, mm-hmm. 2019. Yeah. Uh, a lot of different big stories, big trends, big issues to, to mm-hmm. end, end the year. But 2020, I've gone on record and saying, I think it's going to be the most important year in the fossil fuels history, uh, 2020, for just a lot of different Things seem to be coming at a nexus along with a, a political year as well. So uh, mm-hmm. very interesting times next year. Talk to me what you guys are seeing in your crystal ball. Yeah, well, I think that the 2020 election is probably going to be the most important. I'd agree with you for the oil and gas industry. Uh, what's not talked about a lot is the regulatory certainty the Trump administration has brought to bear on the broader U.S. economy. Uh, we all hate the fact he tweets, at least I do. I think, but on the policy front, uh, Trump made it a priority <clears throat> on, at the very beginning of his administration to reduce the number of regulations on the books, to scrutinize regulation because he saw it as a real headwind against American business development and economic development within this country. He's been wildly successful in reducing the amount of rules. Um, <clears throat> he had a goal for two to one, his first year, he reduced 22 regulations for every one new one that he implemented. So that's probably the greatest story I see going forward is being able to perpetuate that for another four years uh, because it's been $46.5 billion worth of injection and stimulus to the economy with more regulatory certainty. And that benefits everybody, not just the oil and gas industry. But the million dollar question is, will Americans value that? Do Americans value that in those battleground states that Trump won? Polling seems to indicate that in the battleground states that he won that were the deciding factor for him, he still has an edge over the proposed candidates coming out of the Democratic side. And if you're in the oil and gas industry, the rhetoric coming out of the Democratic camp, even the primary season where they're trying to rally their base, is very disturbing. Um moratoriums on using hydraulic fracturing, uh, banning of fossil fuel development on federal lands where we get 24% of our production. Uh, these are very troubling trends. Uh, it's going to be a very important year for um, for the industry because if, if Trump wins, uh, that means four more years of at least being able to position the industry for a, a change that may occur later on. Kind of looking at the clock, we got to wrap it up, so we'll make sure, sure. we have you uh, on the program as we get closer to the 2020 election, which is you know a little sure. less than a year away. But uh, go ahead and give your company a, a plug, and kind of you know we appreciate you coming on the program. So make sure you let people know how it is you guys are making a living out there. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, HBW Resources. We provide political risk analysis and strategic consulting for um, the energy sector. And uh, happy to help with any matters that may emanate from some of the discussions we've had today.